and uh we are recording and we're back for another episode uh with some fun topics today and some not fun panelists um if you two could go around the room and introduce yourselves real quick pretty please jennifer you go first <laughs> all right i'm i'm jennifer hersig um i'm a regional director here for supportive behavior services i'm hannah bomber i'm a bc with abby key consulting Henrietta, uh, for all of you at home, is actually uh, in the housed. process of legally changing my name. She should be referred to. <laughs> well, thank you both for joining me today. Um, everybody at home, they're going to be very mean to me. I can already feel it. Like it's just inside Spidey sense. I'm going to get bullied today. So enjoy it at home, everybody. So, fun topic I want to bring up an idea that was proposed by one of our BCs. This is not a walking original. Uh, I'm not going to take credit. It was not my idea. Um, but the idea was proposed. Since a non-competition, oh, here we go. A non-competition is a restrictive covenant, right? Since they're inherently a restrictive covenant, um, can she, if I don't, she will. So just attack me. So oh, yes. if, if the non-competition is you know, it's legally, it's factually a restrictive covenant. Therefore, if it's inherently restrictive, should that restriction be required to go through the Human Rights Committee for any individual who would be affected by it? So if a BC, you know, these 10 BCs work at Agency A that uses it, the individuals that are served should be provided a form of like informed consent so that they know ahead of time, hey, you're going to select a individual, a clinician from this agency in the event that they were to leave our agency and go to another that performed similarly, you would not be able to go with them. Sign here. Like a single sheet, not tucked away, hidden in a 40 page manual. There's that idea. And then there's the HRC idea that it has to go through the human rights committee. Of course, people's in-house human rights committees are going to approve it. But that to me is a form of informed consent though. Like the parents are reading it and they know, or at least afforded the opportunity to know. What do we think? Is this the time for thoughts? Time for thoughts. Thoughts and okay. thoughts and prayers. <laughs> thoughts and prayers. I think that I think it's a great idea. And actually, to me, I think companies who have those non-solicitation clauses in their contracts, it makes me wonder why they would not be um like open to that idea. I mean, open to that because idea in the just, sense. It's just simply informing that, like, if you choose to go with me slash our company, then we utilize this. You can't go anywhere else, essentially. If you're, yeah, if you're a clinician or your music therapist or your rec therapist. Do you think that that would deter people from signing on with a therapist or a company? Is that the underlying question i think that's a real implication mm -hmm. that... there, uh, there's going to be some people for sure that are like we don't want to do that and then I, it makes me wonder if does does bead step in at some point you know like we are in this um new settings rule and this importance of choice and the ability to you know make your own choices so is choosing your bc part of that or not so yeah, <clears throat> okay. So both of you, I have a cat. If you guys didn't know that, that's stuck with my headphones at the moment. New cat. Thank you, Stella. Um, okay, so both of you said something, right? So Hannah, you said non-solicitation. So one thing that we've talked about in prior episode that I hate is is the the phrasing of this because they'll they'll hide a non-competition agreement and call it a non-solicitation. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about solicitation and we've established that you can solicit, right? Soliciting is just marketing every industry ever existence, except Sriracha, Sriracha advertises, which is solicitation. You drive down the road and you see a hundred McDonald's billboards. That's solicitation. And so. It's semantics, I think. Okay. Right. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. Uh, if I can remember how to do it. Let me know when you can see this. Got it. Okay. 
So we, we've pulled this up before. It's the 460 IAC 6362 Code of Ethics, where, you know, it's basically the Deeds' Code of Ethics, right? And so we, we've highlighted this before and talked about it. Where, uh, where did it go? Here we go. A provider providing services shall not engage in uninvited solicitation of potential clients who are vulnerable to undue influence, manipulation, or coercion. So one of the things that I that I bring up is uninvited solicitation is perfectly legal, right? Simple example, yesterday, I'm minding my own business, car pulls into my driveway, knocks on the front door, I go outside, it's two guys trying to sell uh, like alarm systems in the neighborhood. That was uninvited solicitation. I didn't want that, didn't ask him to come over, never called to inquire. Was it a big deal? No, I no thank you two or three times, they left. Right. So it's perfectly legal. But Beat says in order to be a provider, you can't do that. In the same light, currently in Indiana, non competition agreements are perfectly legal to use. So on that basis, Beats can adopt a policy to forbid them. Problem solved. I think. I don't think having a non-solicitation, like I think that sometimes the consumers that we work with, um, you know, sometimes they are a little bit more subject to some manipulation and things like that. And again, however you want to define solicitation. So I do think there has to be something in place. These are my thoughts. Like, I think you, there has to be something that says like, Oh, me and Jennifer, she's a case manager, we're buddies and like, or I was a case manager and now I'm a BC and now I'm just going to go tell all my clients to come with me because now I'm a BC. I think there are situations like that that happen. Sure. And like, yeah, it is the client's choice to do that. But I also think that kind of screws other people. So I think there's a very fine line. Am I, am I making sense? My word vomiting? No, 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 you're making sense. I've always liked that method of um, bringing in the case manager to that conversation. Yeah. Uh, You know, anytime that I've changed agencies, which has happened a few times, I've always brought in the case manager, right? So Mm -hmm. there was some other party there to go and maybe share more information than I would. Because I would say... I'm not going to be here beyond this day. Just want you to know that. Um, Talk to your case manager because they will give you all your choices, which I think that's a great method. Um, And it just kind of pulls you out of that potential, you know, problem of, well, you know, she offered to take me to McDonald's if I followed her somewhere, right? So you have someone else in that mix, Um, And it just gets really murky when you do have these non-competes that come in after that, right? Even if that process is done, which we've seen where a BC does everything right and that non-compete creeps up and that agency comes after them um, in an ugly manner. And I think that's where like the, everything starts to break down. So like, you know, even if you're a BC who is, doing everything right, you've turned in you know, like a two week or a four week notice and you're trying to do everything you can to make a fair and clean move. There are companies out there that are still going to come after you when you move. Oh, yeah. Correct. 100%, hundred percent. Which is wrong. Like that's just wrong. Mm-hmm. So Hannah, if it's a fine line, how do we start to try to find a way to make it better. In my opinion, it's, it's an identified issue. I've been outspoken about it, obviously, and anybody in, in the industry at this point, uh, they know. I think it's, I think it's as simple, which I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's simple. I'm not really sure, but I think it's as simple as just being clear in the definition of non-solicitation. Like you, says, you, you think uh, about writing, you think about writing a behavior plan, you're putting in examples, non-examples being very specific and clear about what that means. So I think that is like one so we want relatively examples. simple start. Yeah. Cause when I look at this, the, the policy says a provider providing services should not engage in uninvited solicitation of potential clients 
who are vulnerable, you know, comma, who are vulnerable to undue influence. Now, in which even light, that is kind of a who's if to it's say, right, is it uninvited? Well, and who's to say that that person, even though they're they're on the waiver, is susceptible to undue influence? Just because they're on the waiver doesn't necessarily mean that. Correct. Well, if you I know? had a if I had a client for five years and I just go, well, I'm not going to be with this company anymore. Talk to your case manager. They're going to be like, why? Right. What's going, going on? There? Where are you going? Yeah. I right. mean, they've been with me for five years. Obviously, things are going well. They're going to want to follow you to where you go. Mm -hmm. I I think about a specific situation with um, someone that I know. They were a therapist. I'm going to try not to give away like too many details of it, but it was kind of like the situation that I said where there was a, a consumer. They had a case manager who went back to school to be a BC they became a BC um and the case manager and this now new BC kind of teamed up or buddied up in a way and the BC essentially um got all of the hours from this other therapist um and so then like, I don't, I don't necessarily think that that's a fair situation, even though it was the client ch client's choice and that like he could do that, but he essentially kind of took over for that other therapist, even though he had built, I mean, it, it was the client choice. It was the client choice. It's just, well, take it it's away. a little bit, take it away, take away, take away. Cause with, you know, <clears throat> HCBS settings rule, and it is the big person centered movement of like, mm -hmm. you know, guardianship or not this or that choice. Right. <clears throat> and in this situation that you're describing to me, what I hear is, you know, I was loyal to my auto body shop for five years. It's going fine. And then, you know, I was talking to John and Bill opened an auto body shop and I decided I'm gonna go to Bill's. And you're like, oh, that's that sucks. You've been loyal to John for five years. And now Bill just opened his new fancy, better looking place. And that was enough for you to make that choice. You made that choice. Yeah. And I don't, and I think that's what, what it comes down to. It is the client choice. But yeah. like it leaves a bad taste you, in your mouth. It makes it makes you wonder kind of like what was happening behind the scenes a little bit when you know, right? especially when this person, when this consumer in, in particular, I think had plenty of hours to kind of go around. And to me, like as a clinician too, I'm always pr promoting uh, like recreational therapy, music therapy, just to get, build different relationships, get a different kind of service. Yeah. And so. Agree with that. But yeah, it, it, it is, it is client choice. I just think that there's on occasion some situations like that that I and that's why I think that some sort of more clear defined uh definition of solicitation would be beneficial I don't I don't disagree I think we definitely need better examples because mm -hmm. you know people are people are taking interpretations based off of who's involved you know the day of the week and, and mm -hmm. I don't like ambiguity because with ambiguity, it can be enforced differently to different people. Right. You know, I'm not like when you read it, there's so much, like you said earlier, semantics, like there's, when you read that policy, there's so much to it. And I don't feel like we are going to be able to actually achieve what we're looking at as true person centered when we're, when we're still restricting them. Like we well, can, I think that's what it boils down to. Yeah, you know, we can say we're not till we're blue in the face, but we are. If if a disabled person in Indiana can work with a music therapist, a rec therapist, a DSP, a behavior consultant, because it's not just us, this happens in all of them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for three months, thirteen years, and then that whomever they are, rec music PC, you know, gets mistreated. 
you know, and I hate to like have to validate it, but like they could just get tired of working at that place. That's it. You could just grow weary of it. Or uh, maybe other people have been hired and the environment's toxic. Maybe you're being sexually harassed. Maybe in the last four years, you've asked for a raise every year and haven't gotten one. Or maybe you honestly, you moved to the other side of Indianapolis and you want to work for a place that's based over here. Whatever reason you mm-hmm. have, you have the ability, you should have the ability to just, hey, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm a mm-hmm. free human being. And after all those years, that disabled person is screwed. Mm-hmm. That is a mm-hmm. restriction that like at the end of the day, that's a restriction. Mm-hmm. You know? So how do we? I think that's we... kind of what like gets on my nerves sometimes is we see all these trainings that are happening for we've got to be better at helping to make choice, but we're avoiding and not talking about this other little issue of not providing choice, right? Why Which is, is this one so taboo? Why can't we talk about that? Why does that want? Why is that at any trainings? If Pete's going to train um, on choice. Why do we got to sweep that topic under the rug? Why can't we discuss that? I mean, to be mm-hmm. fair, why is that one so taboo? Like like with my my uh, uninvited solicitation example from the Code of Ethics. Legally mm-hmm. speaking, uninvited solicitation is perfectly legal. Door-to-door vacuum salesman, whatever. And so if you can have a policy that bars a perfectly legal act, you can have a policy that bars the utilization of non-competition agreements. You can. Mm-hmm. So why is that one specifically taboo? Anytime it gets brought up, everybody's like, oh my God, is it because yeah. I'm bringing it to light? Is it because the old players are lobbying for them? You know, like that's, just, that's what confuses me. Logically, I just truly don't understand how you can say, yes, this is fully person-centered, you know, it's fully their choice with like, but they, they don't know all of the facts and you don't know what you don't know. So I think that's kind of how maybe things get swept under the rug too, is they just don't know all the information. Like nobody's particularly lying. Clients just don't always know what's going on. Oh yeah. You're lying by omission. You're just, you're sneaking it into the handbook and you're calling it a non-solicitation clause when it's legally and factually a non-competition clause. You just mislabel it, you know, you're buttering it up the wording, which now isn't even buttered up at this point. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I don't believe we can reasonably argue that it's person-centered and there's real choice at the end of the day if we are allowing that to happen. Correct. Which is why I think back to kind of what you were saying, Jennifer, about you like the idea of the case manager being involved. And that's kind of where I was going with the one particular situation where the case manager and and the BC were kind of like teaming up a little bit. I think having some checks and balances would be a really great idea, which could be an opportunity for um, like an HRC to, to get involved a little bit to just make sure that the client is well informed about what's going on and there's more people than I don't even necessarily know if two people is enough to be involved in that decision making the more the barrier I really feel like if that restrictive covenant in somebody's employment manual in in this specific industry is present the individuals being served have a right to know ahead of time Mm -hmm. like specifically be informed not like I said, hide it away in your 40 page manual that nobody reads, right? You don't read them. Nobody reads them the 40 pages. I think this one's important <laughs> enough, you know, cause it does bar you. Like I said, if you've worked with Johnny for 13 years and after 13 years, you've had enough. Some boss is mistreating you, being mean to you, not giving you raises and you want to leave now, Johnny. And, and not just one Johnny, cause your caseload has however many. Now all these disabled folks get the short end of it because the agency is more concerned with keeping them and keeping their, you know, their billing mm-hmm. than taking care of them. Right. We have to be focused on taking care of them. And if taking care of them means they have to go to follow a rec therapist, a music therapist, then it's it's our responsibility to find out what we need to do better so they don't want to leave. Mm-hmm. Right. And even then, sometimes people are going to leave anyways. Like they'll just 
you can't keep everybody happy. You could pay the best, treat the best, and we still, from time to time, people still leave. You know. Yeah. Yeah, but, I know. But, but, but they should have the right to do so, and that's the point. Yeah. It just yeah. makes me think about the days, you know, years ago before I was even working in Waiver, when I would work in an agency and it was time to go, and I would put in my notice, and everyone would be friendly and nice, and it was so great to get to know you, and thanks for working here, and we you like hope a cake on your last day. You serve your time, right? Like you actually do your whatever, two, three, four weeks that you've provided. And then, you know, you move on in, in a happy manner. And that doesn't happen in our industry. Um, you, I mean, obviously there are some agencies out here that will do that. And I have worked for, you know, I worked with Positive Pathways. They were that way. They're like, we wish you the best. And, you know, I started out my time. So, um, but then there's a bunch that don't, right? Like they they come after you, um, the route to you, they cut you off. So if they find out you're quitting, they will immediately go, you're out and just sever their relationship with you, um, and treat you poorly. And so unprofessional. It's so mean. I mean, you know, and I've obviously been outspoken about calling people out, but they're, they're still doing it, you know, mm -hmm. right yeah. now, like you brought that up. Like right now we have, we have, I, I believe amongst the teams, we have two BCs that, are, that have onboarded and both leaving agencies who immediately upon them figuring it out, cut them off. You're terminated. Yeah. You're done. Start calling the families. Oh, she just left abruptly. Uh, we don't yeah. know. We don't really know what happened. Isn't that solicitation? That feels like an invited solicitation. Sure but does. since they were, <laughs> since that agency was technically on the service authorization, then that's a way to. Uh, they can still communicate. You know, mm -hmm. and I mean, that's mm -hmm. happening right now. And, and that's something like I want to emphasize to our 17 subscribers at home is like, we've been preaching about this for a long time. It's still happening. Like mm -hmm. immediately you can't put in your notice in this industry. I, you know, on, on the side, don't really believe in the notice anymore anyways, because it only serves the employer, but I wish people could and be able to serve it out and everything leaves respectfully, but no, they immediately just term you start calling clients and telling them lies which right. which if we go back to this this ethics policy a provider shall not advertise or market services in a misleading manner uh provider shall require all employees or agents to inform the public and colleagues of services by use of factual information so as a provider even if it's me even if it's jennifer we as the provider call up a client and go oh yeah i don't know what happened to Susie. she just left abruptly but like we've got you know johnny available Mm -hmm. is that factual or did that person put in two weeks notice because they're going elsewhere and then you immediately just terminated them and threatened to sue them or threatened legal action mm -hmm. so like aren't these actions in and of itself a violation of this policy mm -hmm. but it's been perpetuated for years and and, and no consequences you know the letters that they send get sent to me the text messages the emails they all get sent to me and mm -hmm. I read them and I go, this is a violation of like three of these, but nothing happens. Right. Because, because why? You know, so how the do The only we... violation is the BC somehow informing the client that they're leaving. That's the violation. Anything else is. And not anymore. Cause we, we are striking that down. No, right. I, I am pushing. We, we are all pushing truth. Yep. Tell the truth. And, and I can. Mm -hmm. And I'll put that on paper. I'll put that on email. I can tell people the truth. I'm leaving. This is where I'm going. I'll be there if you need me, you know? Mm -hmm. Is there like a, uh, it probably wouldn't be annually, but how often does the 460 get updated? Has it ever been updated? Uh, what does that look like? From my understanding, all of that gets updated like mm -hmm. annually, uh, but it's, not, don't quote me, but it's not like overhauled all at once. Usually like this policy got Some updated. Pieces right yeah this one got updated in 2011 this one was updated in 2015 and each individual policy will have like the last time it was updated mm -hmm. uh, date and time stamp um so okay on that notion you don't need to wait until the entire everything can be overhauled you can decide hey you know what we've identified there's an issue we can jump into this policy and and make amendments you know, which is something mm -hmm. we've been pushing with beads is, hey, there are all these actors that are using this as a weapon 
they're attacking and you're facilitating it and they're just unwilling to hear that Mm -hmm. you know they use it as a weapon and they manipulate it just because they want to keep you know people trapped and keep their bottom dollar their profit margin i think what's really sad to me too is the amount of times i see this happen with like young women like i remember myself being 24 sort of fresh out of grad school like a couple years of waiver experience but not that much and wanting you know to leave and i think i see it a lot with other young women and i think that maybe we're kind of an easy target which makes me a little sad too because we don't always know you know all the legal I remember myself just being like, I just want to avoid any legal action. I'm not trying to go to court. Like I'll That's do why what they you do want, it. But like, also, it works. I know. And I think that that, I, that makes me sad. That's all <laughs> because you're I taking it's, advantage it's manipulative. Of, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like you're being taken advantage of because you're, you're excited. Mm-hmm. You're, you're starting to use your degree and someone has offered you a job and it's probably more than what you were making, but probably not as much not as you could be. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, sometimes they ring you in with, you know, those, those uh, non, non solicitation or, you know, no compete. Um, but you don't really know because you're just kind of stepping into this mm-hmm. and this isn't like a big deal. You seem to like the place. Why am I going to go anywhere? And then, mm-hmm. you know, it all comes out later right and and mm-hmm. you're already stuck it's boring, or something it's comes aggressive. along mm-hmm. and I think that's the thing too that I've said for a long time is that I remember when I had left and uh you know my point was I'm not gonna leave a place over a dollar or two and I know that there's some people that would and like that's fine I'm not gonna leave a place I mean to me I have a little bit of loyalty to places that I'm at and you know, it's, it's kind of not worth, worth it or whatever, but, um, but like the amount of money that I was going to be making was life changing, you know, and I had just had a baby and like bought property. And so like the jump that was going to happen was just astronomical. And to me, it's like, how can you keep someone from, from that for your own selfish desires, essentially, you know? Think about that. So, you know? There's a big discrepancy, right, in pay um, in our industry. Like you can you can look and see uh, if you just kind of run through some listings of what some places are paying, and there's some big differences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So when you like Hannah just described, when you see those big differences, and they're a life changing difference. And keep in mind, we're we're living in modern times you know, where the economy is not great, where things are super expensive, you know, why would like that to me just makes sense. Why wouldn't somebody want to? Yeah. For doing the exact same job, by the way, literally no difference other than a quick signature on a pick list. Like, you know, so, so many people will argue, you know, about the pay, right? Mm Mm-hmm. If these 10 providers can, why can't these other 10? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember being told that it was because smaller companies don't have the overhead. I've heard that a lot. I mean, we're a big company. We don't have the overhead. Overhead, many ways of choice. I think think that my response was, that's not my problem. (laughs) That doesn't like... At the overhead directly uh, that doesn't directly affect me like I'm talking about my not that I'm always about like oh I'm number one like that's a whole nother topic but Trim if we're fact. talking about life-changing money then I'm really sorry that you have overhead then I, I, I don't know what to tell you right mm-hmm. do you so, want to be putting most of your money into their overhead right like is it something that's benefiting you right is it uh, an employee or a contractor? Like, yeah. you, do you feel like whatever that overhead is, is benefiting you and also benefiting your client? Right. And I think of that a lot, in my opinion, is a lot of some of the old ways of doing things, like having those big giant office spaces with your big signs lit up, 
we're moving on and cutting the fat. We've learned that we can execute these services without all of that. So, and I think the last time I was on here too, I, I talked a little bit about like, you can choose to make $20 off me or $10 off me. Like I don't, whatever that math was, you know, yeah. like you're, if I work for you, you're still gonna be making money off me. Just learn so, to make less. Yeah, exactly. You know, this is still going it on. It doesn't seem that complicated to me, but you know, I don't <laughs> own a business, so I'm not sure. <laughs> No, and I completely agree because this this to me, so like I'll show this folks. So uh, this is from Mark Pulfer over at James Ferraro Behavior Consulting. He sent this email to a BC. Uh, this letter is to inform you that as of today, 823, we will no longer require your services at FBS. We've decided to terminate our contract with you. We regret to do so and want to remind you we responded and sought dialogue since your termination letter on 821. Basically, you know, she was resigning and didn't return their calls, which you don't have to. Unfortunately, we haven't heard back, blah, blah, blah. You're not required to negotiate or do an exit interview. I guess you're Maximus. He's mad at something. Uh, as a result of this contract termination, please keep in mind that our contract defines solicitation, good for you, under Section 10.1, <laughs> and we will consider subject to legal action. All you did was resign your position. And you're mm -hmm. threatening legal action, any action in violation to this section. Furthermore, we remind you that you have signed and committed in our contract under section 9.4 to not disparage the name, reputation, or goodwill. <laughs> you're doing that yourself with your own behavior. Nobody's right. doing that to you guys. You guys are doing it yourself. So, you know, this is for our behavior consulting. Good old Mark Pulfer. He's a very, very small, disrespectful little man. And he's been known to make these threats and he'll contact families and do the not factual right according to ethics policy you only have to present factual information well they'll call online and be like oh we don't know what happened we thought they were a good one they left for 15 20 more dollars per hour mm -hmm. payable do better they won't leave we have very little turnover they won't leave and it just sucks because that's why our industry i feel like is floundering i feel like anytime somebody bitches mm -hmm. about we don't have enough BCs in the industry and all they want to jump to is the pay. We can pay BCs pretty good and they'll stick around. Mm -hmm. Just pay them. Or if, if they don't, don't treat them like that. Yeah. Treat them with respect. Right. In a professional manner. Like, mm -hmm. you know. did y'all hear that? Did you hear that? Yeah. Oh, Max was growling at uh, the blinds cord. Cause it like, moved because it moves <laughs> and he's like spooky yeah he's like i'm about you to get fight. two puppies and a kitten you're gonna have all kinds of oh, don't don't get me started don't get, don't get me started it's been <laughs> <laughs> gotta get you a house cleaner uh listen that's a real thing in, in my future i hope i've never done it before <laughs> and i kind of feel ashamed but I might do it at least for a little one-time thing because I've been so busy with these and these they're like they need constant attention. So mm -hmm. which is like a quarterly nice deep clean is really good for the soul. That's that's what I'm talking about right there. See now mm -hmm. we're cooking now we're cooking with peanut oil. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, so I guess my last point or question is we've identified this problem. I don't think anybody in the industry at this point can argue it. We've identified this problem, we've called out the bad players who do it. And continue to do it clearly. We have developed a legal aid fund, a professional association, all sorts of measures to combat it. Now, mm -hmm. in order for it to really stop, either the law has to change or policy has to change. To me, it's easier to change policy than law. So policy is DDARs, DDARs and beads agreeing with us over the Ferraro and Shank and Hartman and all of them that utilize these and Jennifer David and all of them that use these. They have to stop agreeing with them and start agreeing with all the agencies that don't use them mm -hmm. and then just change the policy. In my opinion, that's doable. Changing the policy is doable. This is policy. Mm -hmm. I, I can change all of our policies tomorrow if I felt like it. What do you think you would say if you were writing the policy? How would you write it? Oh, just that. 
like what would it what would it include like would you put examples and non-examples like I'm just curious I imagine you're just like staring at the ceiling at night just writing this policy in your head if 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 it would uh be implemented I'd be happy to for free um <laughs> no I haven't really thought about like the longit like the length or like the whole totality of a policy in my mind I was thinking it would be real easy that, you know, like, like with the, that existing ethics policy provider shall not utilize or implement non-competition or similar covenants in their employment handbooks or paperwork or whatever. I mean, FTC, that's FTC may save us from that next year. My fingers are crossed. I mean, I know I don't have a lot of hope that they're going to be able to pull it off, but they are looking at, well, and that's law, right? They're looking to change yeah. law. And so I have more power to them and I hope they're successful, but like in, in, in objective, you know, you put law and policy next to each other. I think it's easier to change policy, but you yeah. know, we're going up against beads who's been favoring all of those bad actors for so many years. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get them to even, you know, respectfully listen to us. I also think because of the semantics of all of it, that I don't know that even if this state or whoever came out and said, you can't do a non-compete, I don't necessarily, do you think that that would change things as far as the IEC goes? Because technically they're saying non-solicitation. Yeah, because that, that that's above it. So if the FTC came in and banned it, that's above that policy. Right. I just mean, I could see them being like, well, it's not a non-compete that's in our contract. No. It's a non-solicitation. That won't fly. Because the court will say, no, you're masking it. No. No, no, no. I don't No, I don't think that in that regard, like, could you still put it in your handbook and call it non solicitation? Sure. But if you were to try to implement it and like sue somebody for it, um, I, I, I don't think I think it'd be shot down because no, the court would recognize it as a non compete and those were, you know, hypothetically banned. Yeah, you do. What already about Companies don't really come after you completely like they threaten you, right? In a lot of cases, send you your legal letters or send you your nasty emails, nasty grams and stuff like that. But they tend to stop short, tend to <laughs> stop short of you know. taking you to court. Because um, it costs money. Yeah, it costs money and they are unlikely to win that. I mean, I don't think we have an example of them winning that. But in the meantime... Yeah. They are hurting the behavior consultant or potentially hurting the company, right? So right. And I think that's a lot of it is like it's an attack. Uh no, I don't know that I don't personally know of any example where any of them ever won. Doug Duggar got settled in his favor because it was a war of attrition. He was right. Marcy had to file bankruptcy. Like you beat her down. Who but like the judge never gave summary judgment because that would have given us precedent to work mm -hmm. with so no i'm not aware of any case where it's actually been ruled but i want to follow up with a question of if there was an actual incident of solicitation yes should a company have the right then to sue that behavior consultant or whoever it may be give me more of an example why would i be suing them okay if I went to a client that one of your BCs has and I was just like, Hey, I'm available for services. And it was an actual like solicitation. Uninvited like, solicitation. Really I'm, I'm going to like buy you a new car if I get to be your BC or whatever it may be. Yeah. That, an uninvited that solicitation. Require... I don't think Sue. I mean, maybe an incident report, right? Like yeah. I think that I'm not suing anybody. Reportable, like suing would be bi mm. a big deal, but I think, you know, Kind of going. This is well, me being the devil's advocate. I'm just yeah, saying. and it is. I mean, it is an issue like that. I mean, that is manipulating a client, right? That's not appropriate. For sure. And reportable incident, I think, where that can be investigated, and then, um, and then beats and can... dealt with appropriately. Well, and and it, and I don't know what they'll do because anytime anything ever happens, I feel like it requires nine new policies, which I disagree with. Like. When you have a hundred people and one person does something and mm -hmm. like, I just go and train that person and then like yeah. we move on. So like right. your example, Hannah, 
you, there's a lot of there's a lot of factors, right? We we provably somebody committed uninvited solicitation. No matter what, it's not allowed. Is that person a BC on their third month, their thirteenth year? I need all the I need mm. all the details and mitigating and aggravating factors, and then you know. Was there negligence on, you know, the agency? Like, there's a lot to look at it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if 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 a BC with some solid experience went to, you know, your client and was like, hey, you know, forget Hannah, I'll take you to McDonald's every time we meet, I'll buy. Yeah, I think that is a complaint worthy event, but like, I'm not doing anything after that. I filed the complaint and it's, I'm not the investigator. I'm not the, you know. And even then, like, I would leave it up to the BC, like, do you want to, who lost the client? You know what I mean? But that, again, yeah, not suspecting, like, we have to, like, have it. Like, we had it recorded or the the consumer comes to us and is like, this is what happened. This is what he told me. Please, you know, help. But outside of, like, being able to just prove it, I'm not following that complaint. Yeah. Outside of yeah, if the guardian or the or the the individual is complaining, then yes, on their behalf we file it, and then they they connect them with beads, and we stay out of it. Yeah, uh, but yeah, my point that all goes back to my original point of like I do think there's probably some shady business happening, so like I think it has to be outlined a little bit. But I think you're correct in the way that it doesn't always have to be legal action. Like that seems like way way beyond, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think I'd be, in, I, I personally wouldn't be pursuing that. I just, I think I've gotten to a point where I figured out enough of like from the reading and figuring it all out. And I've learned that we can actually change it. It's just, we got to get the right people to be willing to, mm -hmm. you know, like I've learned that they have the power. Holly Wimsett, Jessica Harlan York, all of them, Kelly Mitchell, they all have the power because they have other policies that are perfectly legal things that they've just forbidden us to do. So that's one more thing you can forbid us to do. And so we got to find a way to put the pressure on them to make this change. Cause I'm going to keep fighting them. Like you're not going to keep bullying people. I, I'm so tired of people complaining about people leaving our industry. A big reason why they're doing this is because these are their experiences. Mm -hmm. you which know? is sad. And that hurts the consumer, which is what we're essentially all about. Right. And I don't think you can argue that you are person centered and that you're all in this together when you use those kinds of things. Like, I think, I think it's fake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How can you, how can you sit there and tell me, you know, I believe in choice and it's all about the consumer. If when Susie decides to resign, I'm so hurt and offended. I take that so personal that I have to sabotage and tank Susie and then lie to her 12 clients. Mm -hmm. What? No, I think back to, you know, the, the part that makes it the saddest is like, I, you know, I've obviously sent out my fair share of emails and been outspoken, but like most of the worst uh, culprits, perpetrators are the people that were our role models and our leaders in the industry. They're all former okay. presidents of INABC. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's what a lot of people don't understand about the gravity of this is all of our leaders used to lie to us we would go to these meetings where they would sing and dance and we're all sitting there like, yeah, you're right. We support you. But then behind the veil, they were secretly doing other stuff. And now that we've pulled that back is why we're fighting so adamantly. Um, like we're, we're in a lawsuit with a former president of the association because she attacked four BCs, you know, who, you know, she says she was compelled to to do that because, uh, we were recruiting them, but we weren't. We never recruited them. They came to us. So the entire foundation of what they where they were started is false. You know, I think that's where like I'm disappointed. The people that used to be our role model turned out to be frauds, and so we need to stop doing the things that the frauds were doing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If they're all doing that and they're the bad actors, we just we got to do the other stuff, which is quit bullying and beating people up. It's going to be a lot of the issue. What do you say, Jennifer? I'm sorry. I was just going to say, we just need to continue to educate families and clients and behavior consultants, especially new people coming into. Coming mm -hmm. into. Mm -hmm. What were you going to say? Yeah, yeah. I think my thing is like how, like, 
again, I don't know if I, if we talked about this last time, but I've had several conversations at least with Abby before about it's, it can be really isolating being in the field. And so getting the word out almost, and this, is, it, this whole field is kind of about networking. So like if you're working for one of these companies and you don't know about it and maybe you have no intention to leave either, but like, I think the majority of people, if they knew, um, would be, would be pretty fired up about it. Right. I would like to think, you know, and, hope. and so maybe not. I. And we're trying to spread awareness. We're using this medium and a couple others to, to put it out there yeah you know yeah there's a lot of bcs out there that are are in my opinion trapped at these agencies because if and when they decide to leave good luck and like that sucks mm -hmm. we're gonna lose 20 30 percent of them in the industry because of of, of the battles because they're still happening i mean that that uh email from mark pulfer that i showed was from yesterday yesterday we've already taken them on a couple times and i've had my fill with them so this time i just not, think it hold back yeah, I just think it is a matter of if people knew that it was just a threat and it really doesn't, like it would not be upheld in court, I think more people would be yeah, likely but it to jump be. ship. Well, yeah. and it has the potential to be held up in court. It just kind of depends. Yeah. Right. So that... you, you don't want to be the one they decide to make an example of, like, because that, that's mm -hmm. happened obviously and I think I do feel like most of the time it is just they're just trying to threaten you and they aren't going to push it but they they've all had um some very creative different ways that they have tried to come after behavior consultants I think we've mm -hmm. seen it all well and you know if they come after 20 and it works on five they're having some success and that's I think why they keep right. repeating it mm -hmm. you know yeah thought provoking I want people at home all 17 of you Think about it. If you, you know, have an idea on how we can make this change, communicate with us. We'd love to find some ways to make the industry better. It needs it. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, Anna, thank you for joining me. I think I'm going to close this out for today. What do we think? Sound good? good okay. We'll be back for more. We appreciate everybody coming uh, and hit us with some questions. Thank you guys. Thank you. Maybe if I can...